Satan's major plan is to scare you into an uneventful life. The major play of Satan, his, his broadest strategy is to frighten you enough that your life will be uneventful. It's to handicap you, to make you immobile, to stop you, to, to box you in, to put a ceiling on your potential. It, it's true because when you look at the dawn of creation, one of the unique things about the conversation that God has with humanity in those beginning stages of life is he suggested them that they would be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, fill the earth, and to have dominion. It's a very wide, scaping conversation about chasing down all the potential that had been placed in the earth and, and to see and be exposed to all the greatness of, of the world. And since that day and since your first day, the enemy has been trying to talk you out of that. He's been trying to steal from you your zest and your zeal and trying to get you to operate within the confines of limitations that he has placed on your mind, limitations he's placed on your family, limitations he's placed on your emotions and, and all that you could possibly accomplish in the earth. And part of what I want to do over the next few minutes is, is to do irreparable damage to whatever seeks to hold you in bondage. See, my sneaky suspicion is that God has some great things in store for you, and Satan's been talking you out of it. That he's been trying to convince you that you can never amount to, or never achieve, or never experience, or you've gone too far, or you have too little, or you've missed whatever moment, or whatever's taking place, and there's no possible way that redemption could provide for you another chance, another opportunity. But I want to suggest to you that whatever limitations the enemy has lied to you about are, are not true. It's not true. And it's so sad to say many of us have been living a life full of lies. Lies about our potential. Lies about our capacity. Lies about our bandwidth. Lies about all the things that God has prepared before time for us. And my sense is if we could ever break the bondage if we could ever move beyond whatever restrictions have been placed on us, we would be amazed at what we saw come from our lives. Fact is, you're here for, for a purpose. I don't know why you showed up. I don't know who invited you. I don't know what was the inclination or idea or, or what made you get here this morning, but I am fully convinced that whether you are 13 or 78, that this word is so specifically for you because there is something just ahead of you. There is something just before you, and the only thing that is standing between you and accomplishing what God has for you is your ability to disbelieve the misnomers and misconceptions that limit your possibility. So I'm going to read some things to you because I don't trust myself to extemporaneously communicate what I exactly want to say. So I have some thoughts that I don't normally do, but I, that I want to just suggest to you if you were here uh, with me just for a moment. We're in a series called Give Up, and my sense is that we have to give up the control that we attempt to have even over our intellect. And that sounds strange. I'm going to explain it in a moment. This is not some introductory course on being a part of my cult. I'm not trying to get you to stop being thoughtful people. But I do think there are some things that I can open up for you that might show you that maybe some of the ways in which we think are inconsistent with the strategy of God concerning our lives. So I want to suggest to you that you have to guard your mind, that this is the battlefield. Your mind is given as a resource to perceive and initiate what the Spirit directs. If left ungoverned, it can be a source of self-sabotage. This is where the way seems right. So, you're not allowed, if submitted, to just receive anything into this mental space. You have to guard your ear gate, guard your eye gate. You have to give the reins of your thought life to him. That comes through prayer, meditation, silence, solitude, reading, fellowship, preaching, teaching, prophecy, and worship. While reason is certainly given as a gift from God, 
It was never intended to be a stumbling block on the way to heeding his voice. The intellect was designed to serve the purpose of God, to negotiate the physical realm in relationship to his voice. The surrendered spirit now dictates the destination, and your intellect serves at its pleasure. So the mind was to be renewed, not to be held hostage by patterns, ideas, laws, if then, cause and effect, fact, truth, barriers, but to perceive their existence, which actually creates glory for God. Here's what I mean by that. When you think about this idea of how the mind has been given to us as a resource, when you consider the notion that the way in which we appreciate reality is within, within the construct of whatever deductive process, that, that we know there are laws that govern society, laws that govern gravity, laws that govern all manner of things. When you understand that intellectually, and then the Spirit of God steps in by His Word and disrupts that, it actually gives you a greater appreciation of the exceptional nature of God because you know that things aren't supposed to happen that way. I went too fast, went over your head. Let me say it this way. When you know how things are supposed to operate based on common law in the earth, and then God steps in by his word and disrupts what's supposed to be a certain way, it causes you to look back and say, that must have been the hand of an amazing God because this ain't supposed to happen like that. Is that making sense? Let, let me give you another, another example of that. The fact is, I, I actually, um, think, think about it like this. I heard a comedian once say that the Olympics would be more fascinating if there was a regular guy out there running too. It's the context of normalcy that illuminates the exceptional. Here's what I mean. So when you look at the Olympics, and let's just say there are 10 or 12 runners who are running, all of them are so well-trained, are so supernatural, that they only kind of lose within a millisecond or two of each other. Why? Because they're all exceptional. But if I got out there and ran with them, just hear me out. You see, you know, like you say, vote, you know what I'm saying? Oh, you know, Michael, whatever, you know. And they're like, Jeremy Dixon on, you know, block number three. And I'm out there just like, <laughs> and I get in them stocks, right? Once that gun fires and we all start running, and I'm hoofing out there with them, the fact is, you all are more like me than you are your same boat. So the idea of how slow I'm going gives you some context on how fast they're going. Is that making sense to you? Yeah, I can't get not a single help. Don't nobody want to say nothing to me. I'm going to read my word and sit down. <laughs> Listen, your mind is to present context, to say water can't hold you, to suggest that eyes can't be open, to suggest that water doesn't turn into wine, and that people can't tell the elements to adjust their course. And then when faith introduces these miraculous displays, it is quickly identified as exceptional. Here's what I mean. The fact is, it is the notion that, that the water and the winds and the waves do not normally adjust themselves at the beck and call of a man. But when the men were on the boat with Jesus, and they were terrified by what they were seeing in natural law. And then Jesus gets up and says, peace be still. Here's what their response was. What manner of man is this that even the winds obey? What they were saying is this. I've got enough intelligence to know it doesn't work like that. But my intelligence got broken when I saw God step into my situation and do something that doesn't make sense. I'm not telling you not to use your mind. I'm saying God gave you your mind that you might perceive just how amazing he really is. It's when you know how things go. The Bible says at the wedding that Jesus and his men were at, celebrating this wonderful marriage, they ran out of wine. The word of God says that uh, Jesus' mama came to him and said, listen, you and your disciples drank most of it, so why don't you turn and do something about this? The Bible says, Jesus said, listen, I got invited. It's not my problem. You better get some more stuff from the, you know, you know what I'm saying? He was saying, it's not my issue. The woman turns to the, 
the, to the men and say, do whatever he tells you to do. The Bible says Jesus then tells them, take those jugs over there, put some water in it. They go and do what he says. Then they say, go, he says, go and dip and begin to pour. The Bible says as the, wa- the jugs of water were poured into the new containers, they systematically and at the same time turned from water into wine. Now you got to watch this. The fact is you and I know, like everyone else, that water don't turn into wine. Our mind and intellect lets us know that if something like this happens, it must be a miracle. And the Bible says that the man who was hosting said, listen, most often when people bring out the wine, the good stuff is, is don't come out like this. They kind of do it differently. And they had no idea that Jesus had put himself in a situation to adjust something that should not have happened. Let me just say, parent, that I got some points to make, but can I pause for a minute? You're in a situation right now, and your mind is saying, this is not going to work. But let me suggest to you that Jesus is close enough to step into your situation, to break every law, and to confound even your critical thinking. You ought to lift your voice right there and give God a shout because Jesus disrupts natural law. Fact is, your mind and its development are vitally important for the purpose of being able to present as much intel as possible, but it was never intended to make final decisions. So the development of the mind is important, study, exposure, education, that you might accurately assess depth and options in relationship to the voice of God. Listen, I'm not diminishing the importance of the intellect. In fact, I kind of pride myself on reading and being halfway decently smart. And I want to encourage all of you to add as much capacity as you possibly can to your mind. Educate yourself. Read. Travel. Expose yourself. Read widely. Understand the the inner workings of society and systems. And yeah, I believe in that. What I'm saying is this, that's fine until you start putting what you think you know above the word of God that's in your life. God never intended for your intellect to dictate the terms of your life, but to inform the strategy by which you would accomplish whatever he told you to do. The fact is, your mind, hear me family, was never called to make final decisions. Your mind was called to bring about the most, nat- the most natural information that can be introduced, and then the Spirit of God dictates what you ought to do. God, are you tracking with me? The fact is, every single season that we see in Scripture where God introduces himself into a circumstance. He is always confounding individuals on the method by which he does a thing. The Bible says that when Jesus is on the earth, he spits in the ground, wipes it up with dirt, puts it in the eye, and eyes begin to open. The Bible says that a cloak that was on his body was touched by a woman and the blood dried up. The Bible says that napkins laid on Paul's body then laid on the sick all of a sudden brought sick people well. The Bible says that Peter walked by people and the shadow from his life fell on them and they recovered. The Bible says that Jesus walked by a coffin in a funeral, touched a coffin, and dead things jumped back to life. The Bible says that when the walls around Jericho were too hard and too high, he didn't say charge the walls. He said walk around the walls and walk in silence and then give me praise. And the walls that could not be penetrated came tumbling down. Every single time that we see God interact with humanity, he's always disrupting the way we think it ought to be because God loves your intellect, but he's above your intellect. The Bible says... My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Is there anybody in the house that can testify? I had it thought out one way, but God stepped in and did something I could not figure out. You ought to give God praise that God can break the rule. Go in your Bibles Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. Let me read something to you. Then I'm going to go to Ephesians 3. 
And Romans 12 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What's being suggested here as I move to the next passage, that the Spirit of God wants us to have our minds renewed, that there is a pattern in this world that a lot of us, believe it or not, are still operating by, even though you're a Christian. See, some would think that this message is purely evangelistic, that people who are far from God need to hear this message. But the truth is some of us got saved and still held on to some of the patterns of this world. Preach, Pastor Jeremy. The fact is, we still think, even though we've been saved, we still are in bondage to this idea that we have to be poor to prove that we love Jesus. Preach, 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 Jesus. Just come on, help us. We still believe that somehow, because we got saved, that the rules and the structures and regulations that the world really operates by are the way that we should operate. In fact, we look at the disciples, it was the same thing. The disciples got upset, were arguing with each other, saying, Jesus, who among us is the greatest? I want to be the greatest. They were fighting for being great in the context of the kingdom. And Jesus said, Listen, stop trying to live in this situation the way they live in that situation. You can't come in here and bring the world standards into the kingdom. The fact is if any of you want to be greatest, he's got to be the servant of them all. See, you're not getting what I'm saying. The fact is we still jockey for positions 2,000 years later trying to show whose title is bigger, whose collar is fatter, whose parking space is doper, whose seat is closer. Y'all don't want to talk back to me, but I'm still right about it. The fact is so often we have carried into the kingdom a lot of worldly dispositions and understanding and God is saying this, don't work or walk after the patterns of this world. You got to renew and change your mind. See, the Lord saved your soul, but your mind is trying to play catch up. You got to help me. in. The, but your mind is still, it's like muscle memory. Your mind is still, in, in other words, we got you out of Egypt now. We got to get Egypt out of you. See, there's still a slave mentality, and you still operate by a source or a methodology that's about bondage. But I don't know about you, who the son sets free is free indeed. We are free to live according to the power of God. I'm not going to live my life in bondage, always held back, held down, always in knots and complaining, always in some place far off that some have to be scared or shamed about who I am. The fact is I carry the most high God in my body. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. So when I walk in a room, I don't have to shrug my shoulder or dip my head or be ashamed of who I am. Maybe my color is not your color. Maybe my class is not your class, but the Holy Ghost is the great equality, and he's given me enough to be proud and bold and confident. Is there anybody in the house right now that says, I will not walk in bondage. I will not walk in fear because the Holy Ghost is on the inside of me. So Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What I want you to sense from me this morning is there's something the Spirit can do that you can't even imagine. Can I say it this way? It's not just about thinking wrong. It's about thinking small. Sometimes the way in which we have conceptualized our reality is just too limited. And God is saying, look, there is something that I want to and I can do in your life, and the only barrier is your belief. It's not him, it's not they, it's not this, it's not that. It ain't mom and them, or daddy and them, or this and them. It's what you can believe. And Satan's been working overtime since you were a child trying to keep a grip on your thinking. Okay, Luke 5. Let me tell you this story. I'll read it to you, then we'll talk about it. One day, it's Luke 5, verse 1. One day... Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. The people were crowding around him, 
and listened to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so. Y'all remember when mama used to just say, do that? Y'all remember that? I feel like the 80s was the last time you can get whipped and not get in trouble. Like in the 80s, DCFS was like, eh, we'll allow it. You know what I mean? Just, you know, because sometimes children now are like, you know, well, why I gotta? Why? Some of y'all remember when, when you fixed your mouth to ask your parents a question on Saturday, and then you woke up on Thursday afternoon. <laughs> Clothes were changed, hair was combed. You just got slammed in the spirit for a week. What? And that was it. That was it. It was over. Y'all remember that? Said so, because I said so. Right? Jesus said, Look, let down your neck. Simon starts to kind of, he's like, you know what? But because you said so. You went too far. Go back. Verse 5. He says so. I will let down the net. Verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Somebody shout break. Break. So they, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. Come on, say that. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Now, some of you have heard this story before. Please indulge me as we walk through it just a bit. What I want to show you is that in this conversation that takes place, let me kind of give you the full measure and just what you just heard. The fact is Jesus is teaching, and and it's one of those moments where he is teaching a crowd of people and and. Like always, when Jesus taught, it's as if the crowd grew with every word that came from his mouth. And the crowd, I believe at the time, probably started off relatively small. He's probably talking to a handful of people. This is early on, you know, in the ministry. And as he's teaching, the more he's teaching, the crowd is growing. And as you can imagine, his proximity to the crowd makes it difficult for those who are just a little bit too far from him in that moment. So the Bible says, as he's teaching, he sees these boats off to the side. So he jumps on one of the boats and kind of pushes off a little bit. Now, here's why. Just like in this moment, if I was teaching here right now and all of you were gathered in the front next to me, it would behoove me to get some distance between me and you. So I would take a few steps back, maybe walk up on the top of the platform. Why? Because it gives me a better chance to reach all of you, make eye contact in some way, be able to speak to the entirety of the crowd. When he does that, uh, Simon is the one that the boat is taking, and so Simon pushes off and a little bit from the shore. The Bible says after he does that, he then turns to Simon directly, and he says these words, Now, launch out into the deep for a catch. And here's where the conversation gets interesting, because Simon begins to have a bit of a conversation. And and, and I want to say this to you, the, the Word of God was never written as a script. So, so some, 
would think, you know, that, that we're going to get word for word, play by play. That's never the case. Scripture was not written that way. It's not written to give you exactly everything that was said in the conversation. It's a narrative approach in that it's going to give you the full measure of what is meant and intended. So I believe that while this is maybe one or two sentences, there was much more shared in this dialogue between Jesus and Simon Peter. But as he's talking, Simon Peter begins to illuminate what's happening on the inside of him. And I think as Peter is talking, he's really illuminating what's happening a lot of times on the inside of you and me. The fact is, as he begins to speak, he begins to show kind of what he's thinking about what's taking place. The first thing that we hear Simon Peter say back to Jesus is this, that we worked hard. His first comments to Jesus is a conversation about fatigue. He's tired. And I want to suggest to you that in the, the, the grand scheme of God's plan concerning your life, oftentimes the reason that we don't accomplish what God has set before us is because we are worn out. The enemy has fatigued us in our minds. We've got too much on our plate. We've experienced too much in life. And Satan always knew that if we had enough gusto, God could do some great things in us. But Satan has been trying to wear you out and wear you down all of your life. And to the extent that Satan has had the chance to have that type of real estate and grasp on your thinking, by the time you get to something God wants to do, you've got no more energy to do what God has said to do. Preach past Jeremy. The fact is, you know how we are. We often say things like, you know, I'm tired. You know, it's been a long day or it's been a long week. I, folks start the conversation when I'm tired. How you doing? Well, you know, I'm tired. Okay, it's, it's by 4.30 in the morning. I mean, you know, we just got to work. You're already tired. I mean, you know, just, all, we just everybody's tired all the time. It's just so much going on. We're just all so tired. What's funny is when I was a child, my father would laugh at me as a child when I would say things like, I'm tired. He's like, when did you go to work and when did you do anything that would make you tired? You've been sitting in the desk all day in the class. I don't understand how you're tired. You don't know what tired is yet. Now, a few years later, I do know what tired. I thought I was tired when I was young, but y'all made me tired. <laughs> oh God, I love you. I love you, but I'm, but I'm tired. I'm tired. <laughs> the fact is, the fact is, so many of us have found that when it's time to be able to move into what God has assigned and destined for our lives, we have been fatigued by this world. Now, let me just say, this isn't all the devil's fault. The fact is, sometimes you've taken on more stuff than you were supposed to, and you're in more issues than you need to be, and because your plate is full of your own doing, you ain't got no energy left to do what God has called you to do. Preach, Pastor Jeremy. <laughs> This building. So you got to hang up the phone sometimes and get out that chat box and let the Lord speak to your heart. You know, the fact is we spend so much time taking on stuff ain't got nothing to do with us. And God is saying, by the time I want to get you into something that I have for your life, you've been so worn out by the enemy and foolishness and stuff that you don't have the strength to muster up to do what God has assigned to your life. Let me tell you something, child of God. You got to protect your mind and stop letting everything have real estate in your mental capacity. God has not called you to be a part of every single thing. I know you want to be in every conversation and at every event and in every program and with every job and everything, but you can't do everything you want to do and still have enough margin to give the mental space you need to, to what God is trying to say and do in your life. Some of y'all are too tired to do anything for God and God is saying, I can't use tired vessels. I can't use folk that don't have have the strength to show up and do what I've called them to do. But you got to get a second win. You got to get revitalized, take some stuff off your plate and out your life that you can say, Lord, whenever you're ready, we can roll. I've got enough strength to take this next leg of the journey. The fact that some people right now, you've reached a point in your life where you're not as young as you used to be, and you're saying to yourself, you know what, Pastor, I didn't give it my all, and I, I fought the good fight of faith, and I shed blood on the battlefield, I got the blood stained bad, and I'm just going to, let me tell you something, until the Lord calls you home, he's got more for you to do, and so God is saying, while you're tired, I'll just blow a fresh wind into your life, and if you present yourself I can still use you in this next season of your life. Young people, we tired 
Because we're too involved in stuff we don't need to be. I know I'm right. You ain't got to say amen. Hang up the phone. Most of them people you think are your friends are leeches that are zapping you of what God wants to use to glorify himself and to impact this culture. And you have to have enough wherewithal to say, enough is enough. I have to guard my time and my mind that I might be used for his glory at maximum impact. Preach Pastor Jeremy. Tired. He tired. Here's number two. He insecure. We, we, we are insecure. The enemy of our soul keeps us from accomplishing great things for God because we're insecure. Let me prove it to you. Here's what Peter said. He says, We caught nothing. He's like, this is what I do. I'm not a baker. I'm not a candlestick maker. Right? I don't make cupboards. Right? I don't build tents. Right? I don't do none of that stuff. I fish. And I fished all night. And I'm tired from fishing. And I ain't catch nothing. <laughs> and here's what's funny. All of us have that story. Where we're like, I tried. I gave my all. I put my best foot forward. And I ain't catch nothing. And then Satan. It's like, yep. <laughs> this is what he do. And he ain't even work as hard as you when he calls them. Satan is that, is that shoulder to lean on when you want to have a pity party. Preach. Jesus. She ain't as fine as you when she calls something. <laughs> Satan is slick. You know I'm right. Because you know you done thought it. How she get a man? to the mirror like, what? <laughs> I still got it, right? You know I'm right. He don't get to work as early as I do, but he got a promotion? I've been grinding and I caught nothing. So then what starts to happen? Well, what's wrong with me? And Satan is just waiting to answer that question. And you start picking yourself apart. Here's my suggestion, my suggestion that oftentimes the dreams that are deferred are most often aborted because Satan lied to you and said you weren't enough. And there's stuff that God has for you that you're scared to go after because you're concerned that you can't handle it because you got some failures in your past. Sometimes it didn't work out. You got a bankruptcy or a divorce, and you got something that's always talking to you about what you can't accomplish. Peter's like, man, we ain't catch nothing. And many of us are afraid to move into what God has suggested because we ain't catch nothing. Here's the next thing. Oftentimes, it's, it's insecurity, it's fatigue, but a lot of times, it's because we overthink it. You understand what I mean? Can I, let me give you a clue. Jesus says, launch out into the deep so we can catch a catch. Here's the answer. Okay. Uh. 
the simplest thing you could ever say to God. It's okay. That's it. What's Peter start doing? Listen, God, you know. <laughs> Listen, uh, uh, you know. I was 13 years old when I first got to the fishing game, and <laughs> my father, you know. I've learned all the hooks and the shapes and, you know, <laughs> nets and, you know, the boats and drafts. And, and I was out there last night working hard, but I was working hard last night, you know. <laughs> so that wasn't working, so probably it's not a good time, you know, we fish at night and it's daytime. He starts just kind of making it this whole thing. And here's what I love. I, I love that Jesus let him finish. He's kind of like, really? Here's what we do. We overthink it. We overthink it. We have, those of you who have children like me, here's how we operate. If I'm in an environment, a high-risk environment, let's say a parking lot or a place with a lot of unknown variables or people that I don't know, whatever, I, I'm very clear to my children. All you got to do, stay right here next to me because I got you. I know what's going on, and I will tell you what to do. That's it. My children know. It's really simple. We're in a situation where it seems like something may be a little wayward, I'm with you, I got you, right? I know what's going on, I'm aware, I got everything under control, and when it's time to do something, I will tell you what to do. All my kids need to do is say, okay, daddy. The fact is, most of us have that sense about our parenting when it comes to our kids, but we have a hard time receiving that same truth when it comes to our father. The fact is, in every season of life, you are standing next to the most high God. And all you need to know is this. He's got you. He knows what's going on. And when it's time to do something, he will tell you what to do. Most often, when things went awry in our lives, it's because we forgot those three fundamental principles and tried to help God work it out. You remember when God told Abraham and Sarah he was going to give them children that the world could not number? Abraham decided to trust God, but Sarah said, God, that's a great idea. Let me get involved and help you work this out. And the minute she stepped in and tried to help God, she overcomplicated a very simple situation. Let me say it to you this way. When God shows you a dream, he doesn't need your participation. He wants you to sit back and watch him work out a situation situation in your life. But we oftentimes overcomplicate what God is trying to do. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's insecurity. But listen to this last one and let me get out your way. It's fear. Now, what's funny about the way that fear is lined up in this narrative, I think is interesting. Now, if you look in verse 8, here's what it says. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man, verse 9. Then he says this, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, verse 10. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. But then Jesus said to Simon, say it with me, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Now, you got to get this. The fact is, you and I would probably think the, the very common assumption is that fear is introduced before a miracle happens, right? When, when the stakes are high and the situation is in peril, that's generally when fear tries to creep into a situation. But in this circumstance, fear is introduced after the miracle happens. And I don't know if it's the purpose of why it's placed or kind of lines out this way, but here's what I take away from that. It's one thing, yes, to be afraid when things aren't going well, but how do you know that you can be afraid when things are also going what you consider to be too well? The fact is fear has no respecter of circumstance. Fear will jump in in the intellect even when things seem to be working as they should. The fact is when stuff is kind of out of bounds, you start to be afraid about what might happen. But then if God steps in and works out a situation in abundance, you even get more fearful because you're saying, well, Lord, you blessed me this way, but how long is the blessing going to last? Is the blessing going to be enough? I'm braced for something bad to happen. 
You don't want to feel too relaxed or too good because even though God did something great, he might not keep doing great stuff. And sometimes you get fearful. Well, God, can you keep me where you sent me? You know I'm talking to you. Many of us find ourselves fearful, not just in the lack, but fearful in the abundance. My God, the fact is some of us have a challenge because when we think about how God has blessed us, we begin to think, Lord, but you know me and you bless me anyway. And we have a hard time realizing that the God we serve knows all the details of our lives and still will bless us. I feel like Simon Peter was saying, you jumped in my boat to bless me? Don't you know what I was doing in this boat last night? I don't know about you, but there's some people in the house right now that if you'll be honest, when God blesses you, it kind of makes you a little nervous because you can understand why God is still providing even though things aren't always the way they're supposed to be and you feel like you deserved or didn't deserve the blessing so now you walk on eggshells saying Lord are you going to bless me if I make a mistake can you bless if I lose my way can you bless if I lost my mind can you bless if it doesn't work out but God is saying I didn't bless you because of you I blessed you because of me the fact it's my generosity it's my heart that released the blessing in your life so don't be afraid when God shows up God knew you before he blessed you God understood you before he blessed you. God knew who you were when he got in your boat. And the fact is the same God that got in with you is the same God that can take you all the way. What we know about Simon Peter is this, that even though we are so blessed by this first encounter that he has with Jesus, and we're blessed that he's a type of, 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 of Peter was the one that said that, that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We're blessed that Peter was the one that identified his deity we're blessed that Peter stepped out on water and was able to walk as no one else has ever done. It's amazing to hear the story of how God kept him and blessed him. But you can't tell Peter's story without talking about the time he was at the fire. And they asked, they know Jesus, and he denied him three times. We don't shout on that. But the fact is this, God knew in the boat that Peter would deny him at the fire. But the same God that was at the fire still blessed him in the boat. Is there any? Anybody in the building besides me that praises God because even though God knows you, he can still bless you. Don't be afraid. He's with you. He'll tell you what to do. Let me end with this. The intellect does not disengage from its patterns easily or quickly. The fact is a lot of the hard-pressed fixed dispositions that govern so much of our thinking and behavior has to have a systematic way in which it is broken down. I want to show you how the Lord does it, at least in this text. I believe it starts when Jesus is teaching by the water. He's talking to the crowd, and these men, these fishermen, are cleaning their nets, and so that just meant they were in his vicinity. And I heard the type of God that will get in your vicinity. He'll let you kind of hear droppings of things. He'll let you see other people get blessed. He'll let you hear a word here and there. He'll just be in your vicinity. How many of you remember that you weren't fully committed to Christ yet, but you kind of were just hearing some things here and there? That was the process by which God was trying to start you on this path to deliverance in your mind. But the next move after vicinity is the move of proximity because he moves from being kind of a away from him, but near him to being next to him. He steps into Peter's boat, and now he's teaching right next to Peter. That's the moment you got closer. At first, you kind of heard things here and there, but now you're kind of hearing it consistently. It's right upon you, and systematically, some of your thinking and some of the ways you process is starting to shift and to change. But we move from vicinity to proximity, then to identity. The Bible says that after Jesus be, uh, finished teaching the crowd, he turned directly to Simon and begin to talk to him directly. I don't know about you, but there was a moment in my life that after I had experienced some of the vicinity stuff and proximity stuff that God got a hold of my collar and began to speak into my life directly. He took a very broad word, a, a very principal word, and began to share with me the details of my life. He identified my issues, I identified my hangups, identified my habits, and began to speak directly to who I was but he moved from identity to divinity because after he
he's in the boat and he tells Peter to push out a little. Then he goes out into the deep and they catch a big catch. This was the grand moment. This was the chance that God began to show Peter just who he was. Is there anybody in the house that began to walk with Jesus and then one day God showed you something that you had never seen before? He showed you a side of himself that you had never seen before. He showed you power that you had never seen before. I saw the type of God that moves from identity to divinity where he begins to display his authority and his power. But the last move is the best move because not only did he show vicinity and proximity and identity but, and divinity, but then he moved Peter into his destiny. The fact is every single person under the sound of my voice, God has a destiny for your life and God has been systematically breaking down your defense mechanism, breaking down all the platforms and patterns that have been holding you hostage. hostage. Why? Because he was trying to get you to a place that he can take the next level that's in your life. The Bible says that when Simon fell down before Jesus and said, go away, I'm so sinful. Jesus said, get up and leave everything and follow me. There's something greater that I want to show you. And child of God, I don't know where you are in your life right now and where God has you and what season that you find yourself in. But God is saying to someone, I want to show you something that you've never seen before. But I don't want to just show it to you in my life. God is saying, I'm going to show it to you in your life. You've been watching me long enough do great things for you and other people. Now it's time me do great things through you for other people. God is saying, I want to show you your destiny. God is saying, you got to let go of all the hindrances and the hangups and the limitations and the fatigue and the fear of unfamiliar that's holding you back from stepping forward and stepping out. This is your season. This is your time. God has jumped in your boat and God wants to do something in your life that will revolutionize the culture that is around you. Is there anybody here that can testify that you are ready to walk in your destiny? No more limitations. No more hangups. No more fear. No more insecurity. Now is the time. Now is the moment. God is ready to move you into a new place. God is trying to take you into your destiny. The things that were prepared for you before time. The things he created you for. Every person in this room is a person of destiny. And the only thing that stands between you and your destiny is limitations in your mind. Can you believe what God has said about you? Can you step into what God has provided for you? Or will you believe the same old lie he's been telling you for years? That you're not enough. Enough of this. Enough of that. I don't have enough of this. That you don't have enough of that. God is saying, trust me. Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. I got you. I got this. And I will tell you what to do. You hear what I'm saying to you? We don't serve a limited God. Nor should we have expectation that our capacity is limited. God is in our boat. I believe that the breaking of the nets was the breaking of the holes that were on their minds. That the abundance of fish Represent the abundance of God's provision and his dreams concerning us. They were tearing at the capacity of the nets. And God is trying to break your nets. He's trying to break the bondage over your thinking. Give God your intellect. I'm not saying don't think. I'm saying use your mind to do what God says. And trust him. Because there is greater in store for you and me if we can imagine it to be so. Don't let Satan capture your mind. Everybody stand. <laughs> Prayer warriors are coming. Deacons and deaconess and all those who pray. Here's what I know for sure. 
There are people that were here today that the only thing that's standing between you and your destiny is limitations that you've been lied to about. And today, having heard this word, is a chance for you to shatter that stuff. Lord, I'm not going to let Satan convince me that I can't do and be everything you have destined for me to do and be. I'm going to choose to believe you, choose to trust you, choose to put my hope, my faith, my confidence in you. Choose to believe that even if all those things are true, once you step in my boat, all bets are off. All bets are off. And I can do and be everything that has been assigned to my life. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's got to start somewhere. And the regenerative process of the mind is metamorphic. It takes time, right? It's not just a, like the light doesn't just come on, but just he starts to show you different things, some unhealthy ways of thinking about yourself, about your habits, ways in which you are sabotaging your own, your own good, working against your own interests ways in which you are thinking that are in conflict with what you actually believe by faith. God is saying he wants to remove all that. If you would give that to him, he's saying, I'm capable of moving you into a place that you could never imagine. So I'm going to pray a benediction. And then if this word was speaking to you, I, I would encourage you not to rush out, but for let one of our prayer warriors pray with you before you, before you take off. Every hand lifted. Eternal God, we're so grateful for your goodness unto us. And I pray in this moment that you have been clear as you have sought to put within the frailty of humanity this ageless word. But our hearts are overwhelmed because we are so desperately in need of this next season. We feel like the grace has run out for the last season. We feel like time is out for whatever it is that we were in or wherever we were, whatever was going on. And we just sense that there's something more that we've been fishermen for so long, just kind of living off, off this shore, just in this industry. And we just sense that you, you want to take us into some new territory, God. But Satan is lying to us, trying to keep our minds in captivity. So I just pray for a breaking in this place. The anointing of God that destroys yokes, that destroys bondage, that destroys all sorts of governors and limitations that Satan seeks to put on us. And I speak and release liberty in the spirit to believe God again and to trust and to follow him. That our intellect might serve our interests as we follow the voice of God and inform us as we seek to accomplish what he has placed before us. So, Spirit of God, have your way in us. Have your way in us. Now, I pray the seed of this word has found good ground in us. Lord, that the sun won't scorch it, the wind won't blow it, the crow won't eat it, but it will produce much fruit, the type that will remain. And now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest for and abide with us now, henceforth and forevermore. And the people of God said amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.